Hello, welcome to Mark Langley's Horsemanship Podcast, a podcast helping people to understand their horses better, to provide solutions in a calm, connected way. I'm Jenny Barnes. And I'm Mark Langley. I'd like to start today, Mark, by asking you about who has inspired you. And uh, there's a question from Beth who would like to know in particular if perhaps Tom Dorrance has. Um, I think I think Tom Dorrance would be an inspiration to, to anyone. Um, I would have loved to have met him and I would have loved to have, you know, seen him around horses and, and stuff, but I've only seen a few clips of him and I uh, listened to his audio book um oh years ago and what i really liked about tom is he grew up in an era where things were getting done in a certain way and he went against the grain he saw things differently and he and and i and i think he truly wanted to uh you know help horses be feel better around people and education and that sort of thing so i really believe that he was trying to to set up some sort of ideas that that would help horses um, become softer and, and so yeah so most definitely I think that's a great inspiration and he's a great inspiration for that um, I w- without watching him and knowing how he trained exactly um, I think I got a lot more out of his sayings you know like even just the simple saying I follow you you follow me and then we go together things like that like there's little sayings throughout horsemanship that um, I think have come from Tom that I think got me thinking about where he was going with his ideas and you know, some people sort of talk about the Toms and the Rays and, you know, all that, uh, the, all the Dorrances, um, you know, Bill and Tom. and um, But I, I think what we've got to look at is where Tom was going with his thoughts, um, not necessarily how he was doing or what he was doing. It's it's it's, it's the, um, the words that he was saying and where he was going. And I think if Tom was immortal and he was alive today, you know, he was one of those thinking sort of horsemen that, that would be ahead of, you know what was happening because he was ahead back in his time um so yeah i think i think he's a good inspiration a really good inspiration for you know so i think i think um and he was a nice person as well i believe he was nice with people and uh and he was nice with horses so that's what like i think i would have liked to have met him and yeah and i think his philosophy is an inspiration to me because of you know when when he was talking about this sort of stuff and how hard it would have been with all the other people around him doing different things and you know, so, so yeah. Um, and the other ones, the one, but the, the ones that have sort of the, the things that have really changed me in my training and my thinking and my philosophy is, um, um, I read a, a Mark Rashid book years ago when I was sort of taking on a lot of horses and I had a lot of questions about horsemanship on my mind that I couldn't quite answer. And, uh, it was just a couple of his earlier books, um, that, really resonated with me in the sense that um and that got me that got me really thinking about not pushing on our horses so much um and you know if you push your horse away they'll soon know where you want them that sort of things like that that got me really thinking about that now i don't know how mark operates horses uh you know i haven't watched him work with horses i've just those couple of books had some really good um good um good uh i guess enlightening sort of things for me that and and my gut was you know in my gut I felt that things weren't quite right with some things that I was seeing and thinking and um and they helped me you know I guess those old books brought some clarity um and sent me on a direction that I'm glad for and then later on like about 10 years ago 11 years ago I met Ross Jacobs at a clinic and he um his writings and words really made a lot of sense to me about you know directing a horse's thoughts and you know looking at the hardness and softness of their thoughts and um and that also got me um you know really thinking about individualizing everything and learning about the reins um and separating them from the legs and stuff like that and that was really good for for where i was going and what i was thinking about in my horsemanship and then later on i watched harry whitney um over in america because he was an inspiration of ross jacobs and i wanted to go and see see him and and um yeah he He's certainly a, a magician himself when you watch him on a horse and he's really good at getting into bracing horses, you know, directing their thoughts, but also getting the brace out of horses. And, you know, and after watching him, I became a little bit braver at, um, you know, really identifying brace and trying to unlock brace uh, in my training. And, um, yeah, but anyway, that, that, that's that's sort of, I guess, the biggest inspirations for me. But, yeah, Tom, Tom, I think, was an inspiration for a lot of people. And when I met Harry, and you know, he'd obviously rode with Tom, 
um, and 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 Ray Hunt and 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 you know and I think all those good horsemen that have had a bit of a chance to be around Tom have got a lot out of him um, and 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 you know I've I've only ever heard good stories about his personality and his horsemanship so yeah wonderful i'm going to jump into the questions mark from the members for this week so the first one is going to come from andrea and it's all about pack saddling she's got a gelding um who is very reluctant to bend his head or his body when he's turning when he's got the pack saddles on so they can be on without the packs themselves or it can just be that you can just be the saddle and he um either way he's just not happy about them being there quite obviously she's long reined him she's belly roped him um, he can walk past her. She can lead him from behind the girth. And she's spending a lot of time just asking him for a calm, soft hind yield and walking straight out, which seems to work. But then the next day when she puts those pack saddles on, it's back to square one. Do you have any other exercises that she can do to help him? So out on the trail, just to put it in context, um, he's an absolute trooper in a straight line. It's just that she's aware that he's just not going to be comfortable because he's not able to look at them and he's a little mm -hmm. bit sensitive uh, around her. Um, yeah, it, it might take him a little while. By the sounds of it, he might have been one that was that you've sort of, you know, probably worked um, quite a bit on trying to get him good down the sides. And of course, uh, you may have had to work a bit harder on getting him good down the sides. Then obviously, then then new things down his sides. He probably at the back corners of his eyes. He's probably quite, gets quite worried about. And you know, he's got used to you. He's got used to other things uh, back there and working from there. So it's only a matter of time before he gets used to, you know, the pack saddles. Um, but what I would would start to look at doing is um, introducing go back to the the long reining part of things as well. So if you've had some good success in the long reins, the good thing with long reins, especially just get them to sort of flip from side to side so you have the reins around their back end and just get them to look, is I'll use those long reins just to sort of move the horse's hips from side to side and bring their eye around, get a glance on one side, a glance on the other. And so so what I'd probably maybe practice, um, if you've, especially if you've done a lot of leading by and you can see that the horse is softening and getting good at looking back down his side, um, is really getting to uh, engage down those sides because some horses get a little worried and they actually think out their other eye and kind of avoid it, then when they have to see it, they get a bit frightened. So so if you're back in the long range, just get him sort of just moving those hips from side to side, bending the eye around, getting to look back at you and, and, and see you from different angles and just do a lot of like right eye, you can see me, left eye, you can see me, and he has to move his feet, he has to move the hip a little bit in between the reins as well and get comfortable with those boundaries because the pack saddles, um, they've got more, more gear on them that's going to be around him. And then uh, what I would probably do is put the pack saddles on him uh, without the saddle bags, um, and then do the same thing. Just have the long reins and just get him kind of just quietly flipping from side to side and just turning around in between the in, you know, in the long reins, um, and do plenty of like backing, move over a little bit, move over a little bit, backing, move all the way around so you can walk all the way around him and he's just moving the forequarter and the hindquarter in between the reins, just over and over and over and just flipping from eye to eye. Uh, for chronic horses, just for everybody else out there, for really chronic horses that kind of only just get a glance and, and want to pull back uh, it, it, with things down their side, uh, whether it's riding or, or doing groundwork, I, um, I, I grade the exposure on that eye. So I'll take them off their scared eye and then I'll draw them back and then take them off before they take themselves off. And then I'll bring them back and take them off before they decide yeah, to, to, to pull away with that eye and, and avoid what they're looking at. But I think if you just kind of did that a bit more thoroughly in the long reins, um, I had to do that with Marvel. Um, I think I put it on one of the videos um, because I was riding him and he was kind of really stiff down one side and I kind of felt that he just kept wanting to get me a little bit more on the left eye and wouldn't bend to the right. So so I actually did a lesson where I put him back in long reins and I just worked solely on crossing that eye over, get him to see me, lose me, see me and move softly in the reins. And I noticed a big difference when I got back on him on that right side. It made a big change. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd probably work on that and see see how you go. Um, and, yeah, just, just make a point of being there doing, you know, a half hour, hour session of just turning around and rolling around in those reins. And, and then also the other thing you do is you can start to have a flag around them and rub them, you know, whilst you're working them, even before you put the pack saddles on in the long reins, just have the flag at the back, touch him on one side, the other, just get him really exposed 
uh, it, it's swapping eyes and moving around in between that and then also seeing the flag at the back corner of his eye uh, changing from sides to sides and over his back and things like that. And slowly he'll realise that if there's an alternative and he can follow a field safely, that that worry will start to dissipate a little bit. Okay, next question is from Lindsay and it's about her mare, her four-year-old mare, who's had a really bad experience being wormed. So she's now terrified of Lindsay touching her mouth. She's liked some advice on how she should mouth her. She's not yet had a bit in her mouth. So something, if you, I'm just going to probably talk about um, getting getting some some tactile, you know, things happening around the mouth. Um, a couple of things that I've tried over the years with with really touchy horses is touch and go. So you just kind of might rub down the horse and you just quickly just flick a hand across near their mouth and just disappear with the hand before the horse worries about it. Um, and and that's 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 quite good at just getting areas. So you might like say a horse ears, mouth, whatever, where, wherever the sensitive place is, you get sort of close. Um, at the, to the spot where the horse gets a little nervous and then you just sort of just disappear and then come back again and touch and then go and then touch and then go. Um, so before the horse has actually started to pull away, the hands disappeared and, and then it comes back again. And then what usually happens in those situations, you can actually touch for longer and the horse will relax a little bit. But that's you doing all the sort of, you know, work um, reading the horse's anxiety. And though it's going to be a good way of, of getting um, you able to touch those areas for longer, it's sometimes not good enough as when you want to start to really handle those areas and put a bit in their mouth and things like that. So I'd, I'd have a horse a halter on your, on your horse to do this. It wouldn't be done without a halter because you want a bit of control. So if you've got your horse leading well, so leading well means backwards, forwards, moving across. You can move the forequarter away. You can bring it back across a little and all from, you know, your hand underneath the knot and the horse is soft there. If the horse is sort of like fighting at nose pressure like that, then don't worry about the bit because you can't really lead it without that sort of, um, you know, anxiety and worry about, about pressure around its muzzle. So um, I'd, if you have to do that, spend a few days leading or however long it takes till the horse is supple, um, you know, supple at leading, moving its feet, lowering its head while it's moving its feet and then raising its head while it's moving its feet. All those things are super important for really good bridling. And what I what I do now, like once upon a time, I would have just got the horse flexing and softening its head and, and, and yielding to pressure in the halter in my hands. So it's softly moving and can follow a feel of my hands. Nowadays, um, I tend to do the same yielding lesson, but I'm actually moving the feet as well. So I'll, I'll, I'll just, you know, handle around their face a little bit and just move them across, move them backwards, forwards, lowering, raising, all that sort of stuff. So the horse is actually loose in all four feet and yielding the head at the same time. Um, and then when the horse is really soft at that, you go back to yielding and then touching and going with the hand that's going to start touching around the muzzle. Um, and as the, if the horse stiffens a little, instead of sort of disappearing all the time, you're going to have a, a cause you've taught the horse another pathway. You'll, you'll offer a feel of the hand that's guiding the horse. That could be the halter hand or the hand that's just around the horse guiding as a halter kind of thing. So, um, and you just kind of move the horse's feet get them to think into the, the you know the pressure and move into that pressure softly backwards and forwards and things like that and then just sort of touch and go with your hand that's near the muzzle and then just sort of get to a stage that you can sort of touch and the horse then you can sort of offer a feel and the horse will move its head and feet and soften and then you might take that hand away from the lips the one that was there just sort of slowly getting it used to it um and then once the horse can kind of relax a little and trust that hand and trust being in the boundaries of pressure then, then you can sort of go and just put your hand just up in their lips a little bit and just and take it away and then put it in a little longer, take it away until the horse kind of relaxes its mouth. When it relaxes its mouth, um, you know, because really a touching lesson is just another leading lesson. It's just leading leading a part of that horse's body into softness. Um, you know, like, a, a you know, to me, everything is about a horse following a feel and that feel is creating a soft uh, uh, a softness in a horse. Um, so that's why I'm doing a lot of leading lessons from the muzzle or just above the muzzle where they're sensitive. So they're learning how to follow and think with that and they sort of get comfortable that that is a pathway, not a trap. And then, as I say, you can you can uh, just, just gently work on the mouth. If the horse gets too frightened, you can take the pressure of the lips away, the, the one that's handling the lips, and just offer the horse a pathway till it softens and then go back to the pressure of the lips until the horse can, you can put the fingers in the mouth and everything. 
And then once that's at that stage, then the bit will be the next thing. Uh, sometimes a rope is better to start with than a bit, just to, just to hold a lead rope, you know, because it's softer, it's not as, you know, clunky, clangy. So you can start just introducing, get like teach them to open their mouth with your with your finger in their mouth and get them to open softly. Then just start introducing a rope inside their mouth, um, and then and then slowly work that into a bit. And uh, yeah, as long as you can offer your horse an alternative, that's the main thing. Uh, and an alternative usually is follow a feel and, and and soften and soften your thoughts, soften your body. With the young ones as well, I remember that you used to put the bit quite. Uh, loose in their mouth not too loose but it was a little bit loose so they could get their tongue over and under just so they could get familiar with it and then you used to feed them as well so they could just have it in their mouth and it just became part of you know if you do yep. what happened yeah so if you put it in too tight if they get their tongue over it and they can't get it under that's a problem so um you have it a little looser so they can they can pick it up a little bit with their tongue and play with it and uh when they play with it they um you know, they'll get used to it. And then, as I say, they don't get panicked because they can slide their tongue over and under a fair bit. Um, and also starting to eat with it, they get used to sort of, you know, just having it in their mouth. Um, but just be careful, you know, maybe have it in a, a while before you teach it, you know, get them to eat with it so they're quite comfortable. Don't just put the food straight in front of them and, you know, can cause a problem where they're kind of like can't get the food through or they're a bit worried. So, um, but the biggest thing is just, just, just you know, once it's introduced in there, they, they get pretty good at carrying it and, you know, I think some people used to get horses to carry bits for a long time before they started to use them. And you can actually ride them in a halter or something like that and then just carry the bit for days. And, and, and that, that can be also a very good thing. So just moving on to riding, the next question is from Ira, who's got a thoroughbred gelding. When she rides him, he's walking straight, but his head is to the left or to the right. And he sees monsters everywhere. He's very spooky. He's looking somewhere in the far distance. If he sees something he's not quite sure about, he obviously wants to get close to it. But when he gets close, he, he's jumpy and he's frightened. Have you got any suggestions for her, please? Um, the hardest, the hardest thing with with, uh, with 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 what you're going through there, are with your horse is um, you got to go back to square one again, um, as in education, good education, and slowly exposing him slower. Uh, into the trail riding or whatever you're doing um, there's no no quick fix um, you can't just kind of put miles on them and, and fix it because it's almost like um, if you've suffered from post-traumatic stress syndrome and you go into a sort of a high stress environment you get overloaded and you can't regulate as well because your body just goes into that sort of fight flight mode um, so you, you, there's probably a lot of things your horse is not quite understanding when you're riding in a safe environment. And, you know, I, I, I go back and I'd say, okay, well, this is my safe environment. When I pull the reins, is the horse soft? When I squeeze my legs, is the horse soft? Left rein, right rein, is it soft? Uh, is Are those things that I can control, the things that I can control when I'm riding, are they, are they adding anxiety to my horse or are they... Uh, or they staying the horses calm and staying neutral and um, and in the in, and in that environment where you feel a bit safer and the horse is not not overloaded by all this stuff, you've got to see that you know when you see your horse gaze off and look at something and stare at something because they get binocular vision they're staring off off at things a long way away which are not really that 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 means the horse is not centered so um, it's kind of in the future it's mine somewhere else and its body's back here. Okay, so that's why they, they're, they're quite anxious too. So what you've got to look at is, okay, my horse has just gazed off at some horses walking down the paddock and it's fixated on them. If I take a right rein, does the horse keep fixating? Does it let go of that thought? And you've got to look really close at your horse's ears and their eyes and the horse come around and sort of soften and you'll feel them sort of soften and maybe breathe a bit because they when they're fixated, they're a bit more like they're not breathing deep. Um, so you've got to look at everything you do or the basic things that you're using on your horse to ride it, which is the left and right rein and your legs. And, you know, I suppose you could talk about seat and stuff for the moment, though. We're talking about those clear things that can sort of get a horse to let go of a strong thought. And you've got to look at those things and say, OK, did my horse let go of that strong thought and did it come back into being centred as in its awareness is back here where we are? And 
you've got to recognize that every time you pull a left rein, the horse thinks left. Every time you pull a right rein, the horse thinks right. Every time you back it up, the horse lets go of a forward thought and brings his thoughts backwards. Guaranteed. It's kind of, and, and you've got to see your horse soften from that sort of bracy, gazy look and soften and go, I've let go of that. Once you can sort of, once your horse is at a stage where, where you can sort of see him letting go of strong thoughts, um, following the feel of a rein, then you can ride them out and expose them to new places. But as you go into that new place and it starts to fixate and get nervous of all these different things, then you pick up a rein and say, let go of that. And the horse will let go of that thought, it'll soften, you bring it back into a safer place, and then you take it out again a bit, a bit further out. And and until the horse has a coping mechanism and a way to let go of those fixations, because letting go of those fixations is the things that help it relax a bit. And that's the pathway that you've offered the horse to help it cope when it's out there. Because a lot of those things it wants to fixate on, it's only because it's carrying a certain amount of anxiety, it's desperate to fixate on them. So um, a lot of horses at clinics, half, half my battle is trying to teach those horses to gauge or rate the level of threat in things. So sometimes I'll do that with a flag. I'll say, see that flag there, that looks threatening, but it's not a life threatening experience and you don't have to see that as a life threatening experience. So they can start to gauge the level of threat in different things. So instead of seeing a bucket rolling across a paddock and bolting through a fence, they see a bucket and go, mm, I think that's not as dangerous as it seems. Um, I'm not going to be as worried about it, but, but horses that are already on the sort of high adrenaline like yours, when he goes out, everything out there could be, um uh a line a line with a machine gun even a little bucket rolling across a paddock because he's not everything he's seeing is a threat and it doesn't matter how small or big it is it's just he throws it into what is that i don't understand and i'm anxious um and i'm not sure so um your job is to tell him to let go of those strong thoughts um and have a pathway to help him feel better but also in training there are things that you can do to help him have answers when he's under pressure so like things like you know when i'm on the ground i wave a flag a little bit and if the horse freezes and just stares at the flag like it's a horror movie i'll kind of wave it and i'll move the flag around the horse a little bit until it kind of goes oh i might shift a little bit and the horse will shift away from the flag now that shifting might make that horse feel like it's actually done something for itself to reduce its anxiety and then once the horse can shift softly when the flag's put in different spots then I might shake the flag and get the horse to walk and follow the feel, even towards the flag. And so I'm showing the horse that this looks scary, but it's not as scary as you think. And then when the horse can make a little decision around that scary thing for itself first, and then once it's made a decision for itself, then I'll say, now follow the feel of the herd. So the rope to me is like the feel of the herd. Then the horse goes, well, now I'm free to make a decision. Then I'll say, we'll follow the rope now. And the horse will follow the rope when it's a little scared. Um, so those things also help those horses cope. But yeah, I think you've got to recognize those strong thoughts and have a way of getting the horse to let go of them first and do a little test and find out how the things that you're offering your horse works and how it is in that quieter environment before you go out. Having a good tool set underneath you. Mm. Okay, um, the next question is from Carla. Now she's at a barn with a 100 other horses, many highly strung warm bloods. Her question is, what can she do when there's so many horses around and she wants to smack the ground with a rape or a whip to make a startling noise and she can't because it would be quite dangerous for all the other people and horses around her? Yeah, um, there, there's, that's why when, uh, when we're teaching our horses to lead, we get the lead up working good. Like, you know, to me, the flag or banging a rope or something like that is, is like the, the, the tool that we go to when, when nothing's working or the horse is still uneducated. Um, and then the next tool we're going to is, is, um, you know, follow the feel of the lead rope. So if you're, if you're holding onto the lead rope and the horse is like fixated and braced and just, just not really letting go, that's where I get to a stage that I'll sort of like put a bump through the rope and, 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 and that bump is there to go, let go of the fixation and reset their thoughts. So you'll, you'll put a, a clear enough bump in there to say, let go of that. And then you just stand softly and the horse loosens the rope and goes, oh, okay, righto. But when I say to people, you know, put a bump through the rope, I get worried, just like I get worried about, you know, 
flag use. Um, the two things in horsemanship that I see seen, you know, put a lot of brace and a lot of worry in horses was using the flag in a way that just made them think that it's dangerous and they've got to move away from it through all the driving pressure. And a lot of horses got really messed up through that. The other thing I've seen horses get messed up through is over bumping as chastising horses and not bumping in a way that gets a horse to soften, but just blaming it for doing something wrong. So if, you, if you're gonna put a bump through a rope, it's to soften the horse. So the bump's there to let go of the strong thought. And as soon as the horse has let go of the strong thought, you offer the feel of the rope to say, soften through the feel. If you just attack it with a bump all the time, then you'll only make it scared of the rope and bracy. So it's there because the reason you used it is because when you pulled a feel on that rope, the horse was just locked up and still gazing and not really letting go. The bump offered more clarity to let go of the strong thought, but then straight away, there's a pathway there so the horse can go, I like following this feel. Uh, otherwise, you'll just end up be a, a, a bump chastiser and every time you lift the rope, the horse will think you're going to attack them with it. Um, so you, you, you don't want to be going down, down that road. But um, if you just haul on the horse when they're, when they're fixated, then you just pull that brace around and the horse will still possibly be fixated because it's not enough to get them to let go of the strong thought. So, so yeah, you can you can sort of offer that bump through that lead rope and say, let go of that, and then immediately offer them a little bit of soft pathway that could follow you. And also you're offering them an alternative by, you know, you reach out, they sniff on you, they get connected, they're connected with you, and you might just walk off in a new direction. So um, another one is, is, is I'll just be um, very, uh, I'll look like I believe in my decisions a lot, so if the horse is fixated over there, I'll just walk off in a new direction and, and I'll be a little bit busier than the horse, uh, just kind of gently turning. If it looks one way, I'll just go the other a little bit and I'll make the horse feel like it's running slightly late. Now that doesn't often work for all horses, but some horses it works really well for. And you can try that with your horse. It's not going to cause a lot of damage because you're just walking off in a new direction. You, know, you turn your back on your horse and say, well, I'm going to walk over here. And then they go, well, I'm over there. And I go, well, I'm over here. And uh, the horse starts to hunt you and sort of rate you. That's another way that you can you can do, you can try to see if that works. Uh, getting your horse to sort of reset their focus and be and, and see you as a bit more important than, than w whatever else is happening out there. Um, but yeah, if you try those couple of things, you, you, you know, just to see how you go with them. Okay, now Taser is restarting a horse and she would like to know, how long do you spend on each part of learning before you move on to the next stage? She says that she seems to be spending a long time on the leading start stage. Hmm. The leading stage. Um, uh, don't, don't, don't be worried about that. Um, you'll spend your whole life leading a horse, but done right. Leading is steering. So, it's not a, it's not like a, it's a phase that's, that's, I think, I think it encompasses so many other things. I feel like sometimes when I do a workshop or a clinic, I'm there hanging onto a horse's head for half the clinic till it lets go of brace and starts to follow a feel. Um, and some people can be a little confronted with that because they thought horsemanship was, you know, standing back and you know, looking all kind of like body language and do making all these fancy looking decisions where the horse kind of operates through magic around us. And then, and then I sort of show them that the harsh reality of what a horse may have to go through when it's inside a horse float or it's tied up. And, um, and I try and, you know, show them that this is a, a pathway that the horse has to truly trust because we leave them with that lead rope so many times without us being there. Um, and, and, it, and because there's tactile pressure on around their head, it's very important because it's that tactile sort of pressure that the horse has to be comfortable with when in this small boundaries of a horse float, you know, all those sorts of things. And it's that tactile pressure that comes in on their mouth or around their nose when we're riding that they've got to be comfortable and soft with. So don't ever worry that you've got to spend a bit of time there around their head and get them comfortable with that and connect that through their thoughts through to their feet because it's it's worth it it's worth every minute of it if you get it right if you get it wrong you know you might still leave some brace in there um or you might do it in a way that the horse is hunting release um but you like that just yesterday i went and helped a lady who who was going to come to a clinic but she she got the horse loading but then once it sort of pulled out it, it started shutting out to the lead pressure so i 
went and I, get, I gave her a hand and she said, I, I thought I got the lead in really good. I've done everything. I've done the forwards and backwards. I've done all the things. And But there was just a bit more pressure that I could add in there because I, I've worked with those, those shutout braces over and over and over, you know, all the time and, and, and to, to the real heavy braces. So I can get in and maybe uh, get the horse out of a brace and get it, get it learning again and thinking again. Um, and that's this, I guess that's the experience of, of experience, isn't it? You can, you can get in and, and do something slightly different, add more pressure or sometimes even less pressure um, to, to get a horse through a brace. But there, you'll be doing lots of different things with your horses. The one thing that takes a fair bit of time to get right is the leading thing because um, there's so many areas that it encompasses that, that um, there are more things in it. So, but it's not right till it's right, I guess. So there's no particular time frame on it or how long. It's every time you pick up a rope, if you feel a horse shut out or brace, then you deal with it. Um, you don't have to particularly deal with it over and over and over it like that. You're just dealing with it all the time. So you set up little lessons whilst you're doing other things to get that horse to soften and follow a feel. And, um, and then, you know, so you might be doing other things, but you're still working on that brace and that leading. Um, and even when you've got a riding horse, I've, I've started horses and I've ridden them and I know there's still a bit of brace in the lead, but, um, but I also know that, um, they're going to be okay, um, to be, to, to, to be ridden and I can still f work on that brace as we're moving along. But some horses, you wouldn't go past certain braces before you rode them because you knew that if I did this, there's too much risk of a failure. So sometimes that's your gut instinct that you say, well, I could probably just leave that little bit of lead brace there and know that I can fix a bit of it under saddle in the yards. Um, and I can also, you know, keep fixing it every time I catch the horse and lead it up to the paddock. Okay. And do you have a list of things that you think a horse should be able to do well before you start to ride them? The list. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Mark doesn't do lists, people. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like office work. Oh, gee. <laughs> oh, watch out, I might start to shut down while I'm doing the interview. Um, oh, the word list, I've already starting to get a sweat. Um, no, I, 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 there's a lot of things, um, there's a lot of things uh, that, that I, I want a horse to understand before I get on them. Uh, I'll just run through a few of the basic, uh, you know, things that you, you really want a horse to, to understand. So, you want a horse to be able to go forwards and backwards nice and easy to that lead. You know, if you push on their nose and if you push the angle up towards the rein angle, is the horse soft and thinking backwards nice and softly? Can you push it a little firmer and the horse backs a little stronger? Can you slow down and it slows down? Uh, it's not just pressure and disappear, as in the release is a disappearance of pressure. You're slowing down the pressure and landing the horse in the stop. It's comfortable with that. Um, so can I push the horse across? Can I move its hindquarter softly through the lead rope? Um, all those things. Um, the other thing I really would like is if you put them in the long reins and your horse can move around quietly in the long reins, they have to be able to bend really deep into their bends. So though I talk about um, balance and not, not doing just lateral flexion, I want those horses to softly be able to bend all the way around nearly to my boot and be able to find their balance with a hindquarter rein, um, you know, in, in indirect rein. Um, I want them to be able to, so, so you can do that in long reins. You can have them moving around quietly in long reins where they're bending and moving their feet. And you're, you're watching them be able to hold a bend and move all four feet quietly to stay in balance without any fighting and resistance and trying to ping out and things like that. And then when you go from, from that into a backup in long reins, they just roll back into that, no problems. And it just, it just looks like they can, if they got into trouble, they can get out of trouble because they've got the right tools there. That's really, really good to have in place before you ride. Um, because when you sit up there, you, you know, a lot of people will work at maybe 80% confidence on the ground, some, some even more. But when they get up on a young horse for the first time, that 80% confidence could fall down to 40% confidence. And the problem with 40% confidence is you don't make clear decisions. You, you're not as clear and you won't hold a rein the same as you did on the ground. I'm not, and I'm not saying like people who bully their horses on the ground then get frightened on their back. It's not about bullying them. It's about just asking in a clear way and, and having that commitment that the horse believes in. And uh, so if we can get the horse like 100% at that on the ground, that when you commit to that rein under saddle, 
they go, well, I've done that and I can follow that. And you don't have to be like this rain guru under saddle to go, oh, please, pretty please, and all that sort of stuff. Um, the, the horse just knows how to, how to follow that. And, and if you get that right, and it doesn't take that long, then it just makes life a lot easier under saddle. So that, that's one thing that's got to be really good in the leading department and that bit of long running department. They've got to be able to be soft with that saddle. You can put that saddle on, girth them up. There's no trauma, no trouble. You've got to be able to hang off that saddle. Um, you know, if you've taught them to lead with a belly rope, that's fine. And that, that helps them a lot. But if you haven't, but, that, but if they look freezy and braced, then, then you want to be working them through that. Um, can, I, can I sit up on a rail? Can the horse handle me at every corner point, every part of its eye? up high above it that's a good thing to really look at you know if i'm at the hip and the horse is looking back at me and sort of skedaddling that hind quarter away then i know that if i was riding it and i got it on a tight bend like it might just skedaddle and get a fright so so can i can i have the horse moving whilst i'm showing it a scary flag on either side and it can follow the rain and still commit to that rain uh when it's a little anxious um can it soften from that slightly anxious moment into the feel of a rain and go oh yeah i'm okay i got this pathway um, so, you know, can it see sort of scary things at all different angles? Um, can you create a bit of energy through even bumping it with a flag on the saddle down the sides of the stirrups so the horse knows that when you're flapping and bumping, it's okay with that sort of stuff? Um, and then you want to know that you've seen it walk, trot and canter, at least in the saddle, so you know it doesn't just get to canter and go bronking around. Um, and, yeah, once the horses are comfortable with all those things and they're comfortable with you, then climbing up on them is not such an issue but as i'm climbing up i want to see all four feet move when my foot's in the stirrup i want to see all four feet move when i'm hanging off the saddle pulling on it trying to put them off balance a little bit i want to see if they can sort of not freeze and move a little bit so so i want them to know that they're not there's no freeze um are they soft in the eye they're not hardening up and just getting frightened um i look for all those things and make sure that they can do all those things well before i step up and and, and i want to ride um you know uh, i i think you leave a few holes, all it takes is one horse to buck you off, you lose your confidence, the horse loses their confidence, then you're kind of back to, sometimes you can be feel like you're back to square one. Um, but yeah, think of all those things, do all those things, and you, yeah, you, 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 you're going to be a lot closer to yeah, you know, having a soft ride for those first rides. Great, I hope you're making notes there, Taser. There's a lot of information you just rattled off. Um, we need to get you sort of, um, I know a lot of people just love, love it when you do your young horse starting clinics. We haven't been able to do those for a while because they, they are quite lengthy, but, um, that is Mark's, um, one of his many expertise areas is starting horses. So don't be afraid to reach out, Taser, make the most of his knowledge. Um, okay. That's it from the members this week. Thank you very much to everyone for your questions. It's great to have them. Thank you, Mark, for your time. Talk to you again. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks everybody. You can learn more from Mark online through his online training videos. Just search Mark Langley Horsemanship. There's over 380 training videos which everyone has access to with a seven-day free trial. If you like what you see, it's just $15 a month from there. That's help where you need it.